أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية أمير المؤمنين ولئمة المعصومين عليهم السلام والحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا اجل ممدود فطر الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته ووتد بالصخور ميدان ارضه ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد ما صلى على محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين عما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أستق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولكل أمة أجل فإذا جاء أجلهم لا يستأخرون ساعة ولا يستقدمون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلي على محمد أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala there is no doubt that it's due to his kindness and generosity that he gives us opportunities such as these where we gather in remembrance and in reflection of him tabaraka wa ta'ala next we begin this sermon the way the commander of the faithful ali ibn abi talib alayhi ma afdalu salatu wa salam muhammad wa ali muhammad would begin many of his sermons by saying usikum wa nafsi bi taqwallahi al azim I advise you and I advise myself to be God conscious, God fearing and pious human beings. We have been discussing the subject of Quranic eschatology, the subject of death and life after death based on the verses of the Holy Quran. And last week we discussed the meeting of the angel of the death, angel of death, Malakul Maut. And we said that Malakul Maut or the angel of death will appear as a mirror. Yeah. And the reason why it will appear as a mirror because if the soul has been good, if the soul has been pleasant, the angel of death will appear in a very pleasant form to take our soul. But if the soul in this life has been vicious, if the soul in this life has been corrupt, then the angel of death will appear as the same mirror as that individual in a very unpleasant form. And so we learn that you know the process of crossing over and the life in the next realm is entirely in our hands. If we choose to do good, we will find good in return. But if we choose to take advantage of what has been given to us, we will pay the price of that as we cross over and in the next realm. The final moments of one's life are known as sakarat al-maut. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah al-Ka'f, Qaf, verse number 19, وَجَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ bil. Yeah. He says, indeed, the stupor of death or the pangs of death will bring the truth. Yeah. It's very interesting the, the word that has been used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by describing the final moments as sakratil maut or sakaratil maut. Sakra comes from the word sakran in the Arabic language, which means intoxicated. 
Yeah? When a person is intoxicated, they're in the state of sakaran, for example. And this is the analogy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives of a human being who is in that final moments of their life. It will seem as though they are intoxicated. Another verse in the Holy Quran, in Surah number 22, verse number 2, also describes this in the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَرَ nasa sukara." He says, you will see mankind as if they are intoxicated on that day. But they are not intoxicated, God says. وَلَكِنَّ عَذَابَ اللَّهِ شديد. Subhanallah. Yeah? He says, but the punishment of Allah is severe. Yeah? The punishment that they are facing, the azab that they are facing will make you seem as though they are intoxicated. Now what does that mean? Right? The analogy is very on point. When a person is intoxicated with something that intoxicates, yeah, they are not in the right state of mind at that moment. Their intellect is not fully functional at that time. Though they have the eyes, they have the ears, they have the faculties, but they are not mixing or adding together properly. Likewise, at the last moments of one's life, yeah, the person will have their ears, they will have their eyes, they will have their hands, but there will not be a proper communication with the intellect at that time. The intellect of the human being in the final moments of their life will not be able to correspond properly or understand properly, and thus it will seem to them that they are in a state of intoxication. Now why will they be going through that? Yeah? Why will human beings be going through that stage at that moment? And the reasons are many. The first reason that is given by a Mufassirin is because of their strong attachment to dunya. Yeah? Now think about that. Let's say a person lives a healthy life of 70, 80 years and they're good to go for example. Right? They're, they've lived a good life. For 80 years they have been planting roots in this world. Their business, their car, their houses, their jobs, their children, their wife, all of these things have such an attachment to them. Now you're telling that individual that this attachment is being cut off forever from you. Yeah? That is a very difficult pill for many to swallow and because of that, their mind will not function properly at that time. It will seem to themselves like they are intoxicated. Other reasons would be because of the lifting of the veils of this world. As we said that the last parts of one's life, the angels will now become apparent to them. They'll be able to see that which they could not see before. This is a shock to one's system. Yeah? The same way that can be described when a child comes out of the womb of the mother. Yeah? The child is in a state of shock. Yeah? They are in a new environment and thus to get them out of that shock, what do most doctors do? They slap the baby in the back. Yeah? Why? To instill or bring about a crying in them to make them awakened as far as the new existence that they are in. Likewise for us. We are now going, traversing to another reality that is going to be different altogether. And because of these examples, we find that most human beings, if not all human beings, we're going to come to that, will face this sakarat il maut, where this stupor of death, where they lose the reality of existence as a whole at that moment. Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Muhammad wa in Sermon 109 of Nahjul Balagha, he describes very beautifully the last parts of one's life. And I want to read this. It's a little bit lengthy, but it's worth reading what our Mullah has to say. He says, whatever they were ignoring has befallen them. And the death. Yeah, they were ignoring it. They were denying it. It has now befallen them. It has come to them. Separation from this world from which they took themselves safe has come to them. And they have reached that in the next world which they had been promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's now come. The reality has come. Whatever has befallen them cannot be described. Subhanallah. Yeah? Look at what he's saying. This is what we said in the very beginning of this discussion. The Quran has spent one quarter of its verses describing death and life after death. Yet when we experience it, it will be different than what has been described for us. Because experiencing is of another level altogether. He says the pangs of death and grief for losing this world has surrounded them. Ijtama'at alayhim sakratul maut wa hasratul fawt. Their limbs consequently become lethargic. They can't move their bodies anymore. And their complexion begins to change. Then death 
then death increases its struggle over them. In some, it stands in between him and his power of speaking. Although he lies amongst his people, looking with eyes, hearing with ears, with full wits and intelligence, but the angel of death or death has silenced their mouth at that time. This is one example he gives. This could happen in many different forms. He recalls the wealth. He then thinks about how he wasted his life and in what activities he passed his time. He recalls the wealth he collected when he had blinded himself in seeking it and acquired it from fair and foul sources. Now the consequences of collecting that wealth has overtaken him. This is an example. Yeah? If I have spent my life, for example, watching inappropriate things on TV, if I have spent my life, for example, in intoxication, if I have spent my life in backbiting, if I have spent my life in um, all types of hypocrisy, I will spend those final moments of that time thinking about what I wasted in my life. Yeah? This is just one example that he gives about wealth because most of us suffer through um, those pangs or those ordeals. He says, now the consequences of collecting it have overtaken him. He gets ready to leave it. It would remain for those who are behind him. He would thereupon bite his hand with his teeth out of shame for what was disclosed to him about his affairs at the time of death. Yeah? And the angel of death will remind us, remember you did this? You remember you did that. And at that moment you have no feeling besides shame. Yeah? Shame that you have crossed in this way. He would dislike what he coveted during the days of his life and would wish that the one who envied him on account of it and felt jealous over him for it should have amassed it instead of himself. Yeah? People who look at us and say, Ah, that guy has money. I wish I had money. In this last moments of his life, the guy with money said, I wish that guy had the money. I wish I didn't have the money. This is the description that is given to us by our Imam. What's important to understand, my brothers and sisters, this sakarat, this sakra, this, this pang of death or this intoxication of the mind, we can say, spiritual intoxication, will be experienced by all, believer or non-believer, because of the shock of what is coming forward to us. However, for believers it will be short-lived. Yeah? Because we will be given assistance to get over that immediate shock and be prepared of what is coming to us. There's a very lovely tradition I want to end with from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad. He says, وَإِذَا كَانَ الْعَبْدُ فِي حَالَةِ الْمَوْتِ When the servant of God is in the last stages of his life, and when he's experiencing death, يَقُومُ عَلَىٰ رَأْسِهِ malaika. Angels will come stand around him. Biyadi kulli malakin kaasum mimma il kawthar. At the hand of each angel will be a cup from the pond of kawthar. Yaskuna yeah. ruhahu. It will satiate his soul at that moment. Hatta tadhabu sakratahu. Until that intoxication of that mind goes away because of that pure drink. Yeah. And then he continues, وَيُبَشِّرُونَهُ بِالْبِشَارَةِ الْعُظْمَى وَيَكُولُونَ لَهُ طِبْتَ وَتَابَ مَثْوَاكَ إِنَّكَ Oh, it's a beautiful tradition. Yeah. But he says when that drink is given to them, the angels will then congratulate them because of the high status that they have achieved. My brothers and sisters, you know, we can't emphasize this enough. God has described this for us so that we don't play around in this life. Yeah? This life is not a play. This life is not for games. This life has to be taken very seriously. We think 60, 70, 80 years, we're not even sure if we'll reach that far, but we think that that's a long time. When you compare that with eternity, it is nothing. Yeah? It is nothing. Our eternity depends on what we do with this time that has been given to us. And inshallah, we will be amongst those who will be given the drink from Kawthar as we are meeting the angels insha'Allah. Wa akhiru da'wan an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. Sadaqallah. I'll
بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين صريخ المستصرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين اللهم صل على خاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وصل على سيد الوصيين امير المؤمنين علي بن ابي طالب السلام اللهم صل على وصل على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين وصل على سبتي الرحمة وإمامي الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة وما صل على محمد وعلي محمد وصل على علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والحجة القائم المهدي صلاة لا غاية لعددها ولا نهاية لمددها ولا نفاد لأمدها اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات وتابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Because of the actions of the past decade or so where we find that many terrorist groups committing many actions like Al-Qaeda, like Al-Nusra, like Daesh we find that many people have a notion um, they have formed an opinion that Islam is inherently a violent religion yeah? This is the opinion that many have. When you ask them about violence, they many will associate violence um, with, um, with Muslims. In fact, you know, there's a, a survey that was done, and this is in America, and you can, of course, the temperament in America is different, but it said 58% of Americans have an unfavorable opinion of Islam and Muslims. Yeah? That means that's nearly two-thirds of the country think of Islam in a negative manner, right? And this is because of these actions that are being carried out by these terrorist groups that they see throughout the world. And of course, this idea then of Muslims being violent and extremists and these type of things is further promoted um, by fear-mongering politicians like what we see happening, what was happening here with our oral prime minister and what is currently happening with the elections in America and in Sweden and all of this Finland. We see many such examples where this fear-mongering is happening they want to scare people about Muslims and, and paint this picture that, you know, Islam is an inherently violent religion. Um, that being said, you know, this week, I'm sure many of you saw that there was a study that was done. It was, a, it was in some form a data, an, a data analysis that was done. Um, and it was done by a data analyst and research marketer, Tom Anderson. And what he did was he commissioned a study to see which one of the Holy Scriptures, either the New Testament the Old Testament or the Holy Quran was more violent. I don't know how many of you saw this. It came out this week. Many of the major newspapers did not give any credence to this report. Um, and this is what his findings suggested. So again, he took the Old Testament, New Testament and the Quran and he applied it into um, a system where it would analyze the language that was used in three of these scriptures to then deduce which one is the most violent and which preaches the most violence. His findings suggest the following. Of the three books, the project found that the Old Testament is the most violent. Yeah? Um, approximately 5.3% of that text refers to words like destruction and killing. Um, the New Testament comes in at 2.8% of the entire book talks about violence, while the Quran is the last on this list of 2.1% that has this type of language. 
The concept of love, he said, the word love and the concept of love is found more in the New Testament. Um, the New Testament has it 3%, while the Quran has it at 1.26%. However, he says, the concept of forgiveness and mercy actually appears far more in the Holy Quran than in any other scripture. Yeah? Um, he says that the Quran discusses the concept of forgiveness and mercy 6.3% of the time in the Holy Quran, while the New Testament is at 2.9% and the Old Testament is at 0.7%. Yeah? This is a very, this is something that we know about Islam, right? But people want to take a verse here, verse there and say, look, your religion, your, your book preaches this type of violence. When Alhamdulillah, this study, you know, paints a different picture altogether. What's the point of mentioning this? Yeah? The first is, and the most important, I think, is for us to have this knowledge. You know, I think many of us, right, if we were encountered by somebody who presented that argument, they say, look, your book has killing, your book, we wouldn't know how to respond back in an intellectual manner, yeah, in an academic manner. We would reply back with emotion, because that's what we do best, yeah. But here, when we can respond back in an intellectual manner and say, look, the findings actually say something entirely different, yeah, killing appears much more in the other testament. Forgiveness and mercy appears much more in the Qur'an. You know, we can't associate the, the people who follow the religion with what was in the Holy Scripture. right? Because it's our fault that we're not following mercy and forgiveness. Yeah, it's not God's fault. Yeah? How much more does He want Him to say? The fact that He associates Rahmah with His name all times. Yeah? tells us how much he values mercy and forgiveness. Right? So this is the first reason. We must have facts. Right? This is what we told our madrasa students when we were talking about at the, at the time of Islamophobia because of the Paris attacks that had happened. We must have facts when we deal with people. Right? We must know that there are so many Christian terrorist groups out there, Jewish terrorist groups out there, Hindu terrorist groups out there, yet we don't paint the same brush to all of them and say the entire religion is corrupt. Yeah? Have facts when you go at it. When you discuss with facts, you sound smarter. Yeah? And you are able to bring the point home much better. The second reason is, you know, is that when we then engage in dialogue with people, and maybe we will, we don't have to go around telling people, well, look at what the Quran says. No, we know this, right? But if we ever come to that situation where we engage in dialogue with the people, after we mention these facts, you know, we should add the principle and the ethos of Islam to it. And that is that we do not associate the participants of that religion in the blameworthy act of the religion. Yeah? We don't paint the religion as corrupt just because the people are corrupt. Today we see, for example, Hitler, what he did, murdering millions of people, they say, right? And we don't say that entire Christianity is corrupt because of that. We see the actions of the KKK and the Nazis and the white supremacists. And we don't say that entire Christianity is corrupt. This is the akhlaq of Islam, that when we dialogue with people, we should mention that fact. Even though statistics will clearly show that these other religions have committed far worse atrocities throughout the history of mankind than Islam ever has. But yet we do not label them entirely as being terrorists or corrupt. These are the type of information that we should be having at our disposal at all times. And Alhamdulillah, they have come out and the best part of it, it was, it wasn't a Muslim who did the survey. Yeah? Da'wan and Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaytanir Rajeem, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Wal Asr, Inna Al Insana Lafi Khusr, Illa Al Ladina Amanu Wa Amilu Salihat, وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العلي العظيم